Welcome to Stallside Podcast. Bart, how are you doing today? Good day, sir. Yeah, it's good. It's a good day to be here. Very excited about our guest today. Oh uh, yeah, Dr. Noah Cohen. We're going to talk about rotococcus and, I, you know, most of what I know about rotococcus and actually what the world knows about rotococcus came from dr cohen and so it's it's going to be great to have him on here he um spends a lot of time thinking about it and studying it and uh it's a disease that as as you well know is tough yeah it is really tough and it's just good to know that dr cohen is actually one of the people investigating it i mean it's such a difficult condition and what we really want to to get out of today is um his uh, thoughts on the resistance of this organism to treatment yeah. and how this organism is actually out there in the environment and making it difficult for us to get on top of. So, I mean, he's right up on all the research. As you say, he's done most of the research and he's worked with the people that are at the forefront of this right. because this isn't only an important organism for horses, it actually impacts people as well. Yeah. And so the, the concepts he's going to talk about today are going to be very applicable. So this week on Stallside, we have Dr. Noah Cohen from Texas A&M University, and he's going to talk to us about rotococcus equi infection and the resistance of the organism. Dr. Cohen, welcome to Stallside. Thank you. Glad uh, to be here. Th- thank you for joining us. It's an honor to have you here, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us. I'm glad, glad to be here. Yeah. So, Noah, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, yeah, so I am uh, the son of a veterinarian. Uh, grew up uh, never thinking really about doing anything other than being a veterinarian. Uh, fell in love with horses the first time I went to New Bolton Center, which is the University of Pennsylvania's large general hospital, which I know you know well. Um, it was not far from my home and uh, just fell in love with horses and um uh, always uh, wanted to be an equine uh, veterinarian, so I think that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, that's that, that's sort of to the point. So, what we want to talk about today is um, resistance and rotococcus equi to treatment. And you know, you're a storied researcher um, on uh, rotococcus equi infection and foals. And so we're really looking to get your insight on um, uh, in, uh, resistance to rotococcus equi infection uh, and the treatment of uh, this uh, this condition. So um, we'll start off by sort of posing questions. What's unique about the rotococcus equi um, organism and how does that make treatment difficult? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so uh, rotococcus equi is one of uh, a number of bacteria that can infect uh, cells of hosts and uh, infect the cells that are meant to kill them in the host, macrophages, and survive within them, uh, much like mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes TB. It can thrive in the alveolar macrophages that are meant to protect the host. Um, its ability to do that seems to be related to its ability to prevent the uh, host cell, the macrophage, from acidifying um, the compartments that the rotococcus is in, which would ordinarily kill it. So, um, that's sort of uh, one of the things that's unique about it. And, that, and, and I should say that there are certain strains, uh, virulent strains of rotococcus that are able to cause disease. They're the ones that are able to thrive, uh, replicate within macrophages. Um, so being inside a cell makes them a little bit uh, unusual, and, and, and uh, the cell that's meant to kill them makes them unusual. And being able to uh, get into those cells is one of the challenges for treatment. Another challenge for treatment is the fact that they are, um, uh, um, you know, living in an environment that's not particularly easy for antibiotics to get into. So um, it's often full of pus. Uh, there's not much oxygen in there. There's there's not a lot of um, it's very acidic environment, which isn't necessarily conducive to certain antibiotics. It's um, full of degradative enzymes uh, that that can can be. Uh, interfere with the activity of the, of the antibiotics. So there are a lot of um, um, hurdles that the antimicrobials or antibiotics have to get to to get to them. Besides those sort of underlying physiological and microbiological properties, I think it's also to remember that clinical property that's really uh, relevant to why R. E. coli is so hard to treat, which is that it's very insidious in its onset. So quite often by the time we see clinical signs, disease is far advanced. Um, so even, um, you know, 
just because we have an antimicrobial or an antibiotic that's effective against rotococcus in a petri dish doesn't mean it's going to work in the host. And the longer it's been going on, the harder it is to treat. So I think I think that's how I would um, answer that briefly. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. It never ceases to amaze me that you have these foals that are presented to you that they'll tell you, this foal was fine yesterday, and then all of a sudden... It's breathing really hard, may have some purulent nasal discharge, it's running a fever, it's quite obtunded. I mean, how do they get to that point? How is it they compensate yeah. for so long and then it's catastrophic? Well, that's, I mean, we, we to be honest, we really don't know, but it's a slow, progressive nature. So I'm going to tell you a quick anecdote. Uh, Ronald Martins, Ron Martins was the founder of Equine Infectious Disease Lab here at, um, at uh, Texas A&M. And he started his career, graduated from Michigan State, went and did an internship and then a residency at New Bolton Center at the University of Pennsylvania and followed that up with a pediatric fellowship. And when he was, he got very interested in rotococcus equi and full pneumonias when he was at New Bolton Center. And um, he used to get really frustrated with the veterinarians in the, the region around, uh, you know, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, who would refer in foals because they waited so long to refer the foals in. They were on death's doorstep when they came in the, to, to New Bolton Center for, with our equine pneumonia. And he just wished that the veterinarians would be more attentive. He eventually left New Bolton Center and went to one of those referring practices in Maryland and um, got really frustrated with the farm managers and farm veterinarians who didn't call him to look at the bulls that had our equine pneumonia until they were so far along. And uh, finally, he uh, went to uh, Lexington area and became a farm veterinarian in, in Kentucky for a while. And he was determined to be vigilant and, and to catch these uh, bulls and so this will come into play later when we talk about screening, but vigilantly monitoring the foals isn't, um, doesn't seem to be quite enough to get the job done because he had the same experience there in Lexington that you just described where he would be watching the foals as closely as he could and he'd still wind up having foals that were uh, fine one day and the next day they, um, you know, like they, they, they may die. So I think it's just that they progress slowly and then they get to a point where they've just decompensated and then it's like... Um, falling over the edge of a cliff. I'll make one other comment about that, which is that when we first started doing experimental infections of foals to be able to develop vaccines and new therapeutics to better treat foals, um, the first time I infected a foal, we used a relatively low dose to infect them. Um, and my you know, friend and former colleague, Steve Shiger, of uh, uh, was telling me that he didn't think I was giving the foals enough R equi that they wouldn't get sick. And so I was waiting, waiting, waiting for the foals to get sick and worrying that I hadn't given them enough R equi. And then finally, about two two weeks, 14 to 18 days in, it's again almost like they drop off a cliff. They just go from being fine, bright, and alert to quite sick the next day. And so I wish I had an answer to your question. I don't know, but I told you a couple of stories there to, about um, you know that. that similar experience and it is really frustrating and difficult for veterinarians as a consequence yeah it's a really humbling condition because we have people in in that sort of situation you're talking about and they're, they're very closely watching these foals they may be taking their temps twice a day periodically taking blood work and they see nothing and then all of a sudden and right, yeah, sure and, and different presentations too different yeah you know whether it's whether it's lungs or diarrhea or whatever it's 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 acute onset high temp yeah it's, yep. it's tough to treat yeah, it is very frustrating and difficult. Yes, yeah. and you uh, you touched on um, screening, okay, and how we should screen for this condition because it's a difficult thing to pick up. Um, looking at these foals, um, just clinically observations every day. Um, so, what would be a reasonable sort of screening program, and how would that sort of uh, play into how we should uh, on the farm first treat these foals? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I. I um uh, I, I want to say that we really don't have the answer to that question and we need the answer to that question. So, um, and what I mean by that is uh, I'm going to talk through some concepts for screening, but the bottom line is that we have to be careful and use um, uh, a systematic approach, not just to have a good idea, um, but to actually systematically evaluate whether this good idea is truly a good idea in principle. And a great example of that is ultrasound screening, um, which I think in principle sounded like a good idea, but as it was implemented, unfortunately, there's some problems. So I just told you that all those anecdotes about well, the Ron Martin's anecdote about watching closely, that's not going to do the trick, unfortunately. I'm not saying that one shouldn't. One should watch foals closely, you know, taking their temperatures, watching for swollen joints and things that might be telltale signs of uh, impending our equine pneumonia is a, is, a, is a good thing to um, 
to do, but unfortunately it's not enough. Uh, you know, having a blood test would be great, but it turns out that serological tests, monitoring things like serum amyloid A, CBCs, fibrinogens, um, they're just not adequately accurate. They're not, sens- they're not adequately sensitive for specifics. So lots of false negatives and false positives um, that just make them not work very well. And that's what led veterinarians, I think, to um, use ultrasonographic screening uh, to um, try and monitor foals and, and catch foals um, early. Uh, the, the problem is that it seems that at large breeding farms, half, you know, 50% or more of the foals actually have sonographic lesions that are deemed to be attributable to R. E. Coli, um infection. And um, some of those foals are going to go on to develop pneumonia, but it's only a fraction of them. And the tricky part is we don't know which proportion, right? So if you've got, let's say, a half of your foals have, have lesions and only and only 10% of those um, are going to go on and develop pneumonia, you don't know which of those 10% it's going to be. Um, and so because of the value of some of the foals, because of the pressure, because of what we just talked about, the severity of the onset, you know, by the time they show signs, they can be very severely debilitated and possibly not survive. Veterinarians and some farm managers felt like the appropriate uh, attack to take was to treat them all um, as soon as you see there's a lesion that you attribute to our equi to go ahead and treat them all. Um, and um, that helps to eliminate mortality for sure. It will reduce, if not eliminate, mortality from our equi. But the problem is you wind up over-treating foals, and, and I think that has led to the emergence of resistance, which were uh, to macrolides and rifampin that we're going to talk about um, in a bit. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's clear that a more prudent approach is needed. So what would that be? Well, uh, Monica Venner in Germany uh, works in, in Germany and uh, consults for a very large breeding farm there. And um, she, um, for, uh, over a period of years, reduced the uh, amount of antimicrobials that she was using um, by only treating larger lesions. So she didn't, you know, initially she she picked a threshold size. I think it's um, 10 centimeters in, in size and said anything above 10 centimeters, you know, we're going to treat. And uh, when she when she used that, so that's the, when I say 10 centimeters, that's the cumulative maximum diameter of, of lesions. So if you had five two-centimeter lesions, that would sum up to 10, 10, um, 10 centimeters in total. She would go ahead and, and treat those, only the foals with the larger lesions. And what she found was that she had, um, was able to reduce the anima, amount of antimicrobials she was using without having any uh, increase in mortality. It saved the farm money, of course. It also reduced pressure for resistance to develop. So what I, my point of that um, is to say that, you know, perhaps a more prudent approach to treatment. So screening with ultrasound may be um, a good approach, but maybe if we're more prudent or more um, conservative about which ones we treat based on size, um, that can work. A tricky part about that, or two tricky parts about that, two problems with that is what I mean by tricky parts. Uh, one problem is that um, we're not seeing all, you know, what we see with the ultrasound isn't necessarily all the lesions. So a foal might not meet the threshold and might might really need to be treated. The second is that every farm is, is different. So we um, did some work here in Texas that fortunately never got published, but um, at a large breeding farm in Texas, uh, and the size of lesions, um, you know, the when we did some um, statistical analysis of the data, it actually turned out that the, the cut point to maximize sensitivity and specificity was about 20 centimeters of, mm. of total lesion as a cut point. So, you know, it, it, so I think it's going to vary very much farm to farm. Um, I think we have to do some more research to look for alternatives to ultrasound screening. So my practical answer is um, we probably need to treat fewer of the foals that we're finding lesions in and decide how we're going to do that size of the lesions does seem to be a, a good criterion to use, at least a good starting point. I think it would have to be tailored to each farm. I think we need to keep looking, though, for other parameters. Um, and that's why I said to you, you know, we don't really have a good answer yet, because um, I think we need some other tools besides ultrasound. So some of the ones that I, I can think of that would be useful to think about are, um, you know, we know that um, foals that have our equine pneumonia shed more virulent R. E. in their feces than foals that don't. 
on an individual level, we can't use a positive or a negative fecal PCR to identify a pole as, um, you know, uh, mnemonic or not mnemonic because most foals will have our equi in their feces, but there are larger uh, numbers. I think monitoring individual foals, if we start to see increases, um, you know, you have a foal that's got sonographic lesions, you do a fecal PCR, and if the PCR, you come back two weeks later, and if that PCR has increased greatly, then you might say, okay, now this, this is one I, and the lesions have increased in size, maybe I'll use that. That might work, but it might not work. We need systematic evaluation of that. I also think that um, there are um, things like using gene expression profiling, uh, looking for serum biomarkers. We haven't done that. Um, uh, and, and maybe even my, microbiota profiling. I, I'm not optimistic about microbiota profiling, but you know, we won't know till we look. Um, so I think more work needs to be done, which isn't a very satisfying answer for someone like yourself who has got to go out and make a decision today. Um, I know you don't want to hear somebody saying we need more research, but I do want to underscore the importance of doing research, that it's not enough to have a good idea. It's, you know, we, we have looked at fecal PCR and in one limited study found that it wasn't particularly useful. But I would use, uh, I use some caution there by saying that uh, I caution over interpretation of those results because it wasn't specifically, the project wasn't specifically designed to test that hypothesis and we really didn't monitor the individual's um, to say, well, you know, do we see a doubling and or a tripling or quadrupling? And so I think there's opportunity there. Yeah. Um, You've touched on a few things um, with development of resistance. Cases I find frustrating have minimal to no pulmonary lesions. And to Bart's point, they have diarrhea, so they may have abdominal lesions. Um, how does this come about? Is this organism more resistant? Is it is it somehow different when it goes to other sites than when it's in the lungs? And, and yeah. How do we how do we manage a way around that? Yeah, that's a great question. That um, to um, to the best of our knowledge, um, it, the the organisms that are um, it's not that we have different strains. Well, it's not that a, uh, that there are strains of our equi that have tropism for the gut or tropism for the bone, and other strains that have tropism for the lung. That I think is pretty clear. Clearly, not the case. Um, I think what happens is that you get hematogenous spread and it can get into bone and can get into um, other organisms. Obviously, it's in lymph nodes and can spread via lymphatics. And finally, um, you know, it, there, there, um, there is GI. Um, uh, we know that enteric um, infection is possible. It's possible to infect holes with in the, in, in the GI tract by giving them huge numbers of rhodococcus. Um, but it's pretty hard. It's a very difficult thing to do. So I think that it's not clear to me that the enteric infections are necessarily coming through the GI tract. Did that make sense what I just said? Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Cause we've had a lot of trouble getting a head around that. You sort of think, well, where did this come from? Because they're all exposed probably to the same population of organisms. And unless they're selectively grazing the same amount, why does somebody get a pulmonary lesion why does somebody have minimal pulmonary lesions yet they have this eight to ten centimeter abdominal abscess and they're one of those diarrhea foals that Bart was talking about? I just can't get my head around why they're different. Yeah, and I I, I really don't think we um, uh, again people have speculated about it. Um, we've done a little bit of sequencing, which would suggest that. Um, so we've done some genotyping. I mean, several years ago, we we had a foal that died. Um, from our equi, and we kind of want, and it has lesions in its abdomen, um, in its colon, and in, in lymph node abscesses, and full of full of our equi in its lungs as well. And so we we took isolates from four quadrants, uh, you know, right ventral, left ventral, right dorsal, left dorsal lung, and then we took um, lesions out of the small colon, large colon, cecum, small intestine, at the ileum and stuff, and and um, we genotyped them. And um, uh, the genotyping showed that we had multiple different strains. And the only strains that were identical, there was one from the lung that was also in the small colon, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. So there was one that had the same fingerprint. Um, but for the most part, you know, in, even individual foals can be infected with multiple strains of our equi. And I think that a lot of people um, forget that, um, how little we know about the diversity of the strains 
and um, we've also done some um, some sequencing of isolates, trying to see if uh, some of the ones from the abdomen looked different or clustered differently from others. And to date, in a in a limited fashion, the answer to that question is um, that we don't see a clustering of these organisms, you know, abdominal ones clustering separately. So I think, um, uh, yeah. Um, I think there we don't know the answer, and I oh. wish we did. You know. That's that's interesting. We yeah. does that surprise you that there's different organisms in there? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's nature, horse? right? There's going to be diversity. I mean, what is rhodococcus trying to do? Is trying to survive and thrive, and so part of that is genetic diversity, right? Yeah. I suppose. I think so I think I think that um, so when we talk about the resistance, one of the, the the thing that's quite interesting to me is the clonality of the the resistance um, strain uh, or strains. Um, but I think that, um, I think that there is, yeah, there's tremendous genomic diversity and even within the same host that Bart, what I thought of when I first saw it, I was a little bit surprised because I kind of expected, you know, one full, one strain, one strain. Uh, so, yeah. um, and that uh, wasn't the case. And, um, I, I think that, uh, uh, now I've lost my train of thoughts, forgive me. Uh, I, I um, I, I guess I thought it was. I, oh yeah, I lost my train of thought. It'll come back to me here in a second. Sorry, okay. I no, no, th- that's okay. That's no problem. Because clinically, what really frustrates me, we'll have some of these cases. They have pulmonary lesions. We may do a tracheal aspirate. We may get our sensitivity pad and we treat them. The disease seems to go away. Then it can come roaring back four to six weeks later, and we yeah. have we have nothing to treat it with. It's sort of like we killed all the easy ones. And we left the resistant ones, so I'm thinking, did that resistance um, arise in that animal because of the exposure, or was it a different clone the whole time, and it was just exactly. sitting and waiting on its chance? Yeah, and that's not fair. Exactly. That's we, not we fair. We don't answer that, but I did, that, that did help jog my memory. So um, I, I, I think that um, what happens uh, with the, um, uh, the, the fact that we have multiple strains in the same host is really pointing out the importance of the host susceptibility. And I think when you think about this, you know, adult horses are pretty much immune, even foals, you know, we, we know some lovely work that um, Macarena Sands and, and Dave Harhoff did at the Gluck Center where they use different amounts to infect foals at different ages, different amounts of R equi to infect foals at different ages. And it's very evident that younger foals are much more susceptible than older foals. So age plays a role. And then within, within, within the, uh, Within the con- within the constraints of a given age, I also think some foals are just more susceptible than others. Certainly, dose plays a role, and there's probably something to the strains that they're infected with. But I think that the main thing that that told me when I saw that surprising news was how important the host's susceptibility is to contributing to this disease. Yeah, and you know, you've talked a lot about um, resistance as far as you know antibacterial choices, and we're limited. Um, we've got resistance. How can we manage your way around that? What are the things we can do? You mentioned about individual host susceptibility. Is there something a farm manager or veterinarian could do to, to look at that foal and say, okay, we will improve you in certain ways that will improve your resistance? Is this, Are there some management things that can be done to try to minimize the exposure? How would you manage a foal in a farm that you know had antibacterial resistance at a high level? Um. Wow. So, okay. So, um, I think they're, um, that's a loaded question. Sorry, that's a lot. And let me think, let me try to unpack all that. So first of all, I don't think I'd manage them any differently at a farm that had a high degree of, of resistant, um, REQI than susceptible REQI with the exception being that I would want to do susceptibility testing and probably not use macrolides as my first choice. Um, I uh, think that uh, would probably reach for other antimicrobials. Um, and so uh, that, now that's for a full that's going to, so I think we have to talk about whether we're treating subclinical or clinical pneumonias, right? If, are we using screening at the farm? And um, uh, so um, I'm trying to think through the question of, I think the question was, how would you manage a foal that has our equine pneumonia? at a farm that has a high degree of resistance or is your yes. question how yeah. do you okay so yeah. so so treatment wise i think you know i probably would um, reach 
for something else. So what would that something else be? I think it would be either gentamicin, preferably nebulized, um, but uh, given intravenously if, if um, possible. That's not very convenient. Neither of those are particularly convenient for farms. So I think that's why a lot of farms reach for doxycycline and minocycline um, as, as, as antimicrobials. Uh, the problem there is that the, um, I, I'm afraid that from the little bit that we know, so as paper, Steve Shiger and I were first started noticing in, uh, in Texas, he in Florida at the time that there were, we're starting to see resistant isolates um, emerging in sort of the late 2000s. And um, early on when we looked at the antimicrobial susceptibility of some of those isolates from Texas and Florida uh, that were resistant, um, the tetracyclines were... I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was like there were, we had 24, I think, isolates that were uh, resistant, that we felt confident in their phenotype of resistance. And um, those resistant isolates, only 18 of the 24, I say only 18, 18 out of 24, it's not bad, but you still have a proportion of foals that, that that may not work so well on. So I think we need to be aware of that. The other thing that, um, uh, you know, we need to also be aware of is that, um, when we say resistant, we're using sort of a binary concept. It's either resistant or susceptible, and um, it's it's more a matter of the concentration to which the you know even a quote unquote resistant organism might be killed. Macrolide resistant organism might be killed by a macrolide if the macrolide is there in a high enough concentration. Um, and so uh, there are people who will use a combination of like clarithromycin and minocycline, or clarithromycin and doxycycline together to try and, and, and treat a foal with a resistant infection. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I think, you know, we've done some work with gallium maltolate as a, um, as a, as a, a non um, metal, uh, as excuse me, a non antimicrobial, non traditional antimicrobial. It's a semi metal compound that um, works, uh, appears to work as well with the resistant isolates as it does with um, susceptible isolates in vitro. In vivo, we really don't have, even any data beyond a small scale trial we did in, in, in central Kentucky, uh, um, where we showed that it was not inferior to a macrolide for treating subclinical pneumonia. So coming back to, if you told me you had a subclinical pneumonia problem at the, if you had a subclinical case at that farm, I might suggest reaching for gallium, reaching for, um, minocycline, reaching for doxycycline, um, yeah, um, one of those antimicrobials, uh, genomycin potentially. Yeah, you mentioned about um, in the situation there was resistance not going to the macrolides. What is particularly unique about the macrolides which makes them a difficult choice to use where there's resistance? So I don't think it's um, that, that makes them, a, I don't think it's that the macrolides are a difficult choice where there's resistance. I think what's happened is that um, so first of all the combination of a macrolide and a pampa and I um, I don't need to tell you uh, uh, that that you know for over thirty years that's been the standard of treatment right so long term use created fallow ground for resistance to develop anyway but I do believe that we've got some evidence for some studies I can show you some slides if time permits um, uh, to show that it looks like the treatment of foals that screened positive. So the combination of ultrasonographic screening with macrolide plus or minus rifampin treatment of foals that had sonographic lesions, in other words, any foal with a lesion, healthy or sick, getting treated, they were mostly healthy, any foal with a lesion getting treated with a macrolide and rifampin, I think drove the emergence of macrolide resistance in central Kentucky. And I think it's um, more that the, it's the specificity of the resistance genes that were selected for and acquired that um, has created the problem. Did that make sense? Yeah. Was that clear? Yeah. So yeah. I, it's actually very interesting that if you look at the um, strains of macrolide-resistant R. equi, um, they're clonal. So in other words... The isolates in central Kentucky are all the same strain. I just told you you can take a foal from, if you have, if you went to a farm today and had a, um, I hope it wouldn't happen, but if you had a foal that died from our equi in central Kentucky and you took isolates from different parts of its body, 
I suspect you might find multiple strains of our equine, as we talked about earlier. But if you have a foal that's died from a macrolide resistant strain, every strain that's macrolide resistant in that foal is going to be probably the same strain. Because, um, and that's not true just in Kentucky, but mm. in Texas, um, we had one just um, a couple of years ago, a foal that died from, uh, started with a macrolide susceptible infection. <clears throat> Subsequently, after long-term treatment, it was not getting better, got infection in the bone. The strain that came out of the bone was macrolide-resistant strain. Clonal, same clone as what you would have in Kentucky, is what we had here. It's even spread uh, internationally. So it's a, Jose Vasquez Boland um, is an investigator at the University of Edinburgh who studies our equi and, um, and, and in particular studies our macrolide uh, resistance. And... Um, He's been able to document spread of that same clone to Ireland. Another piece of work that Jose Vasquez Bolan's lab has done, has done that's really important is they've also um, gotten some isolates um, uh, recently out of Louisiana where they showed that it's the clonality, the first sort of escape from clonality, if you will, um, uh, has been documented at a farm in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the spread of this macrolide resistance has been a single strain, basically, spread all around the area because of the pressure from selection pressure from overuse of macrolides. Um, and it's coming to other, spread to other case places because horses travel a lot. They, they go to other states and to other countries even. And so uh, it's been clonal. But the pattern, um, it's fellow named Morgan Scott, who works here at Texas a and who's an expert on antimicrobial resistance. Um, and I remember hearing Morgan give a talk one time, and um, he made the point that infe resistant infections typically follow this pattern of being clonal initially, and then the clone, then they, then they, the the, the uh, resistance factors get shared with other strains, and it becomes less clonal. And I think we're starting to see that happen with our equine. <laughs> That's actually really sobering, you know, because I knew there was resistance out there. I didn't realize they could be all traced back to sort of almost like one point source from what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So interestingly, um, we've actually, uh, so we've been, um, I say we, so, you know, Steve Jaguar is uh, unfortunately no longer with us, but um, Laura Huber, who was a graduate student of Steve's, um, she's now at Auburn University and, um, we're continuing to do work to study the epidemiology of macrolide and tampon resistant isolates. And um, um, in, in Laura's PhD work, she, um, we found another clone, a resistant clone in Kentucky. So um, the resistance to macrolides is um, uh, generally caused by genes called ERM genes. It's not the only mechanism by which resistance can occur, but the um, there is this or these ERM genes that cause a methylation of the of the um, ribosomes in uh, that prevent the um, uh, bacteria from being impacted by the by the antibiotics. So the antibiotics are no longer effective um, as a result of having this methylation of their ribosomes. And the um, the um, ERM um, the, the ERM the, the strain that I've, we've been talking about being found in foals is called ERM46. The ERM46 gene can be found in isolates from clinic, foals with clinical disease or in the environment. But while we were monitoring what was going on in the environment, we found um, another ERM gene unique to Rhodococcus equi called ERM51. So let me back up and say that ERM46 is unique to Rhodococcus equi um, and, uh, and can be found in isolates from foals with disease or in the environment. The ERM51 is found only in the environment. It hasn't yet been documented. I'd say yet. To my knowledge, I'm not aware of any reports of, of ERM51 having been detected in foals yet. But it is persisting in the environment. And um, uh, um, back in 2017, when we were collecting data, um, back in 2017, uh, Laura um, uh, was working on a study uh, where um, we, she collected uh, soil samples from 100 farms in central Kentucky. 76 of 100 farms had 
macrolide rifampin resistant R equine in the soil. Um, 98% of those isolates were resistant to both rifampin and um, uh, macrolides. And uh, that's a pretty, pretty scary, um, pretty scary, um, pretty scary number. Uh, we've gone back to those farms now five years later in 2022 and collected some more soil samples. We didn't get soil samples from all of the farms. And to be honest, um, first of all, I don't want to steal Laura's thunder. Um, um, this is her work and she'll be analyzing the data soon and presenting stuff. But we've gone back to look to see what's happening. You know, how much ERM-46 is there? Is, it, is there more of it or is there less of it? Is there... Um, um, uh, and, and, is, and is the relationship of whether there's more or less of the ERM-51 and the ERM-46 resistant strains, does that um, have anything to do with macrolide rifampin use? Um, so this would be a good place. I'm, I'm going to do, um, uh, is it okay if I do a screen share thing now? Yeah, absolutely. When we first um, started, you, you are seeing the picture though? Yes. Okay. So when we first, uh, so let me let me uh, um, orient you to this figure. So in this figure, we have a bottle of pills here meant to represent antimicrobial macrolides. Okay, so this is macrolide antibiotics, and this is a full bottle, meaning lots of it. So we have a lot of antimicrobials that increases pressure in the environment for the resistant organisms to survive. So we have some little gold-colored organisms here that are meant to be just you know, other microbes that might be in the soil. The little red, ruby-colored ones here, red, ruby-red um, things here are meant to represent susceptible Rhodococcus equi, and the purple ones are meant to represent resistant Rhodococcus equi. So we've got this situation where overuse of antimicrobials has given rise to selective pressure for more resistant isolates to be in the environment. Okay. Our hope was that by reducing antimicrobial use, we would get less resistance in the environment because we know that in mice and in soil, the resistant isolates are less fit. They have lower fitness. They're less able to survive and compete. So they should be outcompeted by the susceptible ones. That was our hypothesis when we first started investigating this. We're excited about um, the potential to, you know, ask veterinarians to use less antimicrobials to control the problem. But here's the bad news. The bad news is that that's the first outcome, and that's what we thought might happen. But we were talking to a woman named uh, Liliana Salvador, who's a microbiologist at the University of Georgia. And she pointed out to us that, unfortunately, bacteria are... Um, pretty good at um, surviving environments that we can't necessarily, they're pretty good at survival. And um, they are able to either lose genes or gain genes that can make them compensate for the fitness, reduced fitness, which means that even if we reduce antimicrobial use, it might be too late the genie might be out of the bottle. There's evidence in vitro for this phenomenon. And the importance of the study that Laura Huber is doing right now, coming back five years later, is we hope to be able to see, <coughs> excuse me, we hope to be able to see whether this has occurred actually in vivo or in, in, in the real world. I won't say in vivo, but in, in nature. So in essence, what you're saying is that the uh, susceptible bacteria were better in their environment and could survive. The resistant bacteria, there's a price for that resistance, and so they're less able to survive. However, they're a little bit promiscuous with their genes, and the ones that were better to survive actually got the resistance genes. So what I'm saying is that the resistant isolates can pick up genes or even lose genes. Yeah. You know, just because of selective pressure um, okay. and, uh, and, and find ways to compensate. There's some in vitro data to support that for other bacteria that happening. There's sort of gaining a loss of um, genetic modifications that allow genes that have acquired resistance genes that reduce fitness to compensate for the fitness loss to become fitter. So, um, yes, so, so, so there's some evidence for that. And then, as I said, we, 
we do know that they're less fit. Uh, the, the, res the macrolide resistant ones do appear to be less fit in soil and in mice um, than, than the susceptible ones. But what we don't know is what's going to actually happen in nature. So it's a big question. We don't know the answer. And um, we've, 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 um, we're trying to answer that question. It's a really important question for, for you all there in central Kentucky to know, because if we see that it's, you know, reducing antimicrobial pressure can reduce the, inc the, the incidence or the frequency, the prevalence of these organisms, then that's great. That helps us to say, okay, well, there's a chance of um, um, putting the genie back in the bottle, but it's possible that these um, genes are out now. And, there's, and it's an even bigger, from a One Health or a public health concern point of perspective, it's also of concern because we know that um, these resistance genes can be shared to other bacteria. So these ERM genes can get shared in that soil environment to other bacteria. Some of those bacteria are potential pathogens of, of humans. And more importantly, you know, our equi picked this up from some other organism, presumably. And, and so it can be passed around, you know, from, it can probably be passed around, um, uh, uh, even though there's some, uh, there's, these these ERM genes can't be transferred to all bacteria necessarily. You couldn't you couldn't take an R equi and get it into any coli, let's say, very likely to have happen. But over time, when it goes from one bacteria that's closely related to another bacteria that's closely related, eventually they're all sort of you know the the potential exists for a, ba a bad scenario here. Yeah, just imagine if that got into strep. Right, strep zoo. I mean, that would be pretty. You guys are stuff. full of great news. Oh, yeah, of course we are. But this is this is biology. It says rhodococcus equi is just trying to make a living and trying to survive, and this is how it does it. So we're in a situation where um, genes are widespread for resistance. We have difficulties with the drugs that we choose. How can we raise the barrier to infection? How can we imp um, improve the resistance to infection of the foals, management-wise, plasma? Briefly, what's your take on those things to try to reduce the number we have to treat to, to try to reduce the antibacterial usage? Yeah, and I think that really is the key. I think, you know, prevention is it's less sexy than treatment, but it's definitely um, the, the, the better and more effective approach. Uh, the problem is we have some, bur um, bur uh, some bur barriers or hurdles there as well. So on, um, you know, on prevention, you mentioned the environmental and, you know, what can we do management-wise. We, we don't have good systems. So we have some epidemiological data that suggests that reducing the density of mares and foals at farms can help. Um, so that sounds good, but, you know, uh, a, a large breeding farm the, the, you know, the more that, that's not a very compelling economic argument, right? So, uh, you know, have fewer, but, but if places could afford to have the same numbers on larger acreage, then that's, uh, I, I believe that might help, but I want to, okay, so I want to just put a caveat now and I'll repeat it in a second that epidemiological investigations, associations aren't always causal. And I think we have to be really careful going from saying, well, we know that farms that have less density have less R equi. Well, there are other contributing factors besides the density of mares and foals, and it doesn't necessarily follow that changing the density would work, right? Is that clear? It's a very yep. important point. So, so the, and another one just like that is foaling at pasture. So we know that foaling at pasture appears to farms where foals are born at pasture or farms where some are born at pasture and some are born in stalls indicates that foaling at pasture appears to have a protective effect. Having said that, without an intervention trial, we don't know whether that's true or not, and we've got to be really careful that a lot of things, you know, because not all associations are causal, and there could be a lot of other confounding factors that differentiate farms that have less density from farms that have higher density. Um, and so I, I, I just want to urge caution there and say, that a lot of people are trying a lot of things for management that are based either on anecdotal data or markers saying, well, we know that if we have, uh, if we, um, if we, if we use a certain practice, if we scoop manure out of the stalls, um, you know, five times a day, then we're, we have less airborne R equi in the barns. That's true, but that's not a, that's a surrogate marker. That's not an indication of whether or not those foals will go on to develop pneumonia. We need to do controlled experiments for these, and it's going to be really hard to do those studies. So I'm, 
I'm not saying that there aren't and uh, there, there isn't the potential for management to make a difference, but I think we're a long way from being able to do the studies that we need to. We need to have those studies, and I'm not sure how feasible those studies are going to be if they get done. Yeah. So that 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 takes us to okay. Well, what else do we have for prevention? A vaccine would be ideal. I'll come talk about that in just a second. I'd like to talk about the plasma because you mentioned that, and you know, plasma is one of those things that's tricky because um, it uh, it's it's not going to be completely effective. Uh, we shouldn't expect any, you know, we, we, we see that antimicrobials are, for treatment aren't completely effective. We shouldn't affect, expect plasma to be completely protective. But the bulk of the studies that have been done, um, the bulk of the evidence is that, that plasma transfusion can help reduce the incidence of our equine pneumonia. I think that, um, that there are... Um, when, when we talk about antibodies for therapeutics uh, or for prophylaxis, there are three. Um, there's a fellow named Arturo Castavalo who works at Johns Hopkins Hospital right now, uh, a, a, a leader in the field of uh, you know antibody-based um, antibody-based therapeutics and things in human in human medicine. But you know he points out that there are three things you got to look for. You got to look for specificity. You've got to look for timing, and you've got to look at dose. So specificity, I think the I think it matters whether it's R equi hyperimmune plasma versus not R equi hyperimmune plasma or PNAG hyperimmune plasma versus not versus standard plasma. So I think having antibodies against R equi in the in the plasma matters, and the amount of antibody matters. Um, and so I, I I was going to mention that third, but I'll just jump to that now. The amount matters, and we know that there are differences in manufacturers in the amount of plasma and even within manufacturers within, you know, at least between lots, there appears to be, there appear to be um, differences. So I think that uh, that probably explains some of the variability that we see, just the variation um, between manufacturers, between lots and batches um, that, that can play a role in the efficacy and how well the plasma is going to work. The other um, factor um uh, that pertains to amount is that the initial studies that were done, the first study that was done showing that our equi plasma protected foals against our equi pneumonia was done here at Texas A&M by Ron Martins, the fellow who founded our lab uh, in, the, in the late eighties. And he was working with pony foals. He gave the pony foals a liter of hyperimmune plasma and that became the industry standard. So when John Madigan did the first field trial, he used the liter of plasma because that's what Ron used in the folds here, I think, because that's what Ron used in the, the folds here. It's a convenient volume, it's whatever. But those were pony folds, 25 kilogram folds. And so that's really a dose of 40 mils per kilo. And and Ron had always advocated that we should be using two liters of transfused folds, not one liter. Um, and um, so we have a little bit of data um, from some subclin folds of subclinical pneumonia in Texas that we did in collaboration with the ranch here. And then um, actually, um, Patty Alshweet, um, Patty Flores Alshweet from, from near practice in Saratoga, um, did a study with foals that had clinical pneumonia and showed that the foals that got two liters were less likely to develop our equine pneumonia than foals that got more transfused with one liter. Um, and I think that, um, I, so I think the volume that's transfused matters. And I think a lot of foals are underdosed. Timing is another key issue, um, uh, for antibody therapies. You, the earlier they get them, the better. Um, so I think that's one argument for transfusing foals with two liters early, uh, soon after birth. Um, but another argument for it, it would be that uh, that's when foals are most susceptible to infection. Again, um, a little bit of experimental work from Ron, uh, nice experimental work done by um, Macarena uh, Sons and Dave Harhoff at the Gluck Center suggests that foals are much more susceptible early. And so that's probably when it's key for them to have their protection. And um, I'm not sure that waiting a month transfused with a second liter um, is the best way to go. I think they'd be better off to have that plasma early. But at this point in time, that is a, I've given you a little bit of science behind the opinion, but it is an opinion. It ha the, study, there's a, the study needs to be done, but I don't know that it'll ever be done because of the, the, the size of the population that you would need, the cost of getting it done, pretty much. Is when you say early, is do you feel that there's a difference between six hours and twenty four hours, or six hours and forty eight hours? Um, 
I yeah. So the, the bottom line is um, uh, that that we don't have the answer to that. There's no good answer to that question. But my opinion would be that um, I, you know I'd rather see it in them at um, 24 hours than 48 hours. But I don't know that 48 hours. Uh, that, that's that's just my belief that they, you know they're getting exposed early, and the earlier you can have it in them, the better. But there's no. I think if you're getting it in them within 48 hours, that would be that's great. And I and it's so dependent on you know. I think the, the the farm environment and what what works for the farm, right? So, um, you know, there's no point in trying to do something that, you know, to say, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back at midnight because the you know <laughs> the transfuse is full. You know, waiting till the next morning would make a lot more sense. I think for everybody's sake, yeah. Um, and and we don't know that we don't we don't yet know the answer to that question. So it's just an opinion, and that always makes me, um, you know, I'm always nervous about giving opinions. But my opinion would be. I'm not sure there's a big difference. Well, your, 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 your opinion is uh, better than mine anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to say, I'm going to say no. <laughs> I'm going to say no. And sometimes, sometimes, you know, yeah, evidence, not eminence, as they say. And I, I'm not sure that, um, I think it's really important. I think that's part of the problem we have is that we, we've done a lot of things with rotococcus based on what, you know, logical deduction and opinions and, and experts saying do this and do that, that, um, may not make a lot of sense um, and may not be right. Uh, I think this just really emphasizes what a difficult organism this is to deal with and how the best of intentions have made things worse. Right. Um, just just briefly, you mentioned um, vaccination. Um, what's the prospects? Because it's going to be difficult to vaccinate yeah. against. Yeah, so it, it clearly is difficult. People have been trying and trying lots of strategies for a long time. Um, so, so the bad news is that it, it looks tough. Um, and the, and the hurdles seem to be um, those get infected, we think, quite early, uh, quite soon after birth. And they're very susceptible to infection at that age and not very immunoresponsive, right? So, the, so, so that makes it really hard. And they've got widespread exposure, as we've talked about. So they're exposed to it. They're susceptible to it. Um, and their immune system isn't working very well. So that would make it you pretty pessimistic. Um, but uh, I'm an optimist at heart, and I think there is some encouraging news. So you may remember uh, that in the late 80s, uh, John Prescott's lab at um, Guelph showed that when they gave foals large amounts of our equi in their intestinal tract, they did it the first week of life, and then again at the third week of life, um, and then they came back and challenged them. Um, I think I have those ages right, but certainly first couple of weeks of life, they got two large doses of, of R. E. Qui and administered enterally. Um, and then they came back and in their guts and then came back and challenged them in their lungs uh, and they were protected against infection. And they, they repeated that in 2005. And just last year, um, we have some ongoing work in, in this area, but last year we, we did an experiment where we, we repeated that and, and found the same thing. So mm. repeatable finding. But one thing that was a little bit different about our study last year was that we did it when the foals were two days and four days of age. And they were protected against challenge infection at 28 days of age. So that tells us that foals can mount a protective immune response even though their immune system isn't great, right? They are able to do it. That exposure happened. Obviously, you know, you could argue that they've got ongoing exposure because we've dumped it into their gut and it's persisted over that three-week period of time. But the exposure was happening at that age. So that suggests the possibility that it could happen. There's also a study that was done in mice. So another factor that um, limits the, a factor that limits the immune system of foals, it's not the only factor. There's so many immune responses are, are very um, limited for early uh, after birth, but uh, their uh, antibodies, they have maternal antibody interference, which is um, you know, something that uh, happens in multiple species. Um, but there's some evidence from mice that mRNA vaccines are um, less impacted than standard vaccines. And in fact, that mice pups can be protected against influenza when they're vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine for influenza, but not with a traditional vaccine for influenza. Mm. So uh, always a little hesitant because there are lots of vaccines that worked in mice that don't, lots of things work in mice that don't work in, you know, horses or people. 
So I want to be cautious about that. But we're looking into an mRNA vaccine approach um, as well right now. Well, that's the holy grail of holy uh, grail of prevention, isn't it? Really, is vaccination because everything else that um, you've talked about is again, as I was saying, best of intentions have um, led to an increase in the problem. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say one more last thing about vaccines. If I'm not, am I? Am I? Hey, you're good. Yeah. yeah. So I'll say one last thing about vaccines, and I think that the, um, I think we have to have realistic expectations. So. Um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, next year I'm going to need to get four times the dose of influenza. I'm going to need the, the high dose influenza vaccine next year because of my my advanced age, and um, and I can expect about 11 percent uh, efficacy of that vaccine um, in my for, to protect me against influenza. Uh, I think we have to lower the, the bar of what our expectations are for a vaccine. I think a lot of Equine veterinarians, I think a lot of farm managers have the expectation that if we vaccinate for rhodococcus, we're going to eliminate in the disease. And I just don't think that that's a reasonable expectation. Um, so uh, I think we have to lower the bar and realize that we may have passed on some, we may have um, not uh, investigated some vaccines um, because we had the, the bar for protection set too high. I think that's probably a fair comment. When you look at things like West Nile, tetanus, rabies, I mean, they are extremely good at creating protection, but any case of rhodococcus you don't get is a good one. But the same frustrations of voice to me was farm managers that use plasma. They say, yeah, but I still had some rhodococcus cases. I sort of said, but imagine if you hadn't done anything. It could have been a lot worse. And you're right. I mean, nothing's 100%, but any, any fall we don't treat is a good one. Yeah. Yeah, and they can gain viral infections with neutralizing antibodies versus, so think about how much effort and money has been spent on tuberculosis vaccines and, um, and the efficacy of the vaccines that are licensed. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not providing sterile immunity and mm -hmm. complete protection. Um, so I think that's another, um, that, that's another, um, uh, yeah, I think we need to think a little bit about, uh, what our expectations are, um, or a vaccine for our equine. Yeah. This has been a fascinating talk. Um, it's really sorted out a lot of things for me, and it's also emphasised a lot of the things that are really difficult about rhodococcus equi, in that they're all out there, they're swimming in a sea of resistance, and all we can really do is minimise the ones we treat to not make that worse. Yeah, no, I want, I want to thank you too. It's been a very informative uh, time together. And every time I'm with you, hear you speak, uh, you, you've, you've taught me most everything I know about rhodococcus. And I want to thank you for dedicating so much of your life to studying it and to the University of Texas A&M for uh, supporting you and allowing you to do that because it's it's definitely helped me and my clients. Yep. Well, thank you. We're trying hard to get practical solutions. And uh, thank you for acknowledging the university because uh, – I'm grateful to, to be supported and be able to work here and, and have that support. And I also just want to say that, uh, you know, a lot of the work I've done is possible because of Steve Shiger, he's not, he's not with us any longer, but just that um, um, we sort of uh, became friends and just decided we'd open up and share and, and work together. And that's really how we have to, to do work. So I'm also grateful to your practice because a lot of the field work that we've done has been, um, you, know, you guys have participated, uh, whether it's in Saratoga or in Lexington, so very grateful on my end as well. Well, again, um, we are, uh, we're so much better off for everything that you've done, and I can't thank you enough for the, the wisdom that you've imparted on us today. Yeah. So that was uh, Stallside for this week. We were with Dr. Noah Cohen from Texas A&M University talking about rhodococcus resistance and how difficult this condition is to manage. See you next time. Stallside Podcast is brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. As partners in your animal's healthcare, we strive to bring you the highest quality medications, including custom compounds that are formulated and produced right here in our pharmacy. Along with medications, we also strive to bring you high quality and relevant information, such as that available here on the podcast. So if you like what you hear and see, be sure to refer us to your friends and remember to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. We've done a lot of great episodes already that you may need to catch up on with more just around the corner. One last reminder, nothing you 
hear on the podcast should be construed as veterinary advice, which should only come from a veterinarian with whom you have a relationship.